begin our next track at this hour in which we're talking about why it matters, why a faith in Jesus matters. And our next speaker is Nathan Ward. Nathan is a professor of biblical studies and apologetics at Florida College. And when we began talking about apologetics, some of the work that he has done uh, led many to suggest, yeah, we need to ask Nathan to be a part of this. And we're honored that he is being with us. We are especially honored because he told me this morning, today is his 20th anniversary, and he's not with his wife, he's with us this morning. So give him an extra kudo this morning for being with us, and we appreciate uh, that. Uh, Nathan, his educational background is with Liberty University, New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary, and Knox Theological Seminary. Uh, he is the author of a couple of books, one of which is available in the back, Unseen God, in which he looks at the book of Esther. Uh, also, he's written Growth of the Seed that looks at the book of Genesis. That first book that I mentioned, uh, we've been plugging something that's coming soon that we're calling Short Studies, and uh, three books in particular have come out that way. Outreach, which was a special series to promote this lectureship, Fellowship, and also the Holy Spirit. And in the Holy Spirit book in particular, there's a lesson on providence that's done by Reagan McClenney. And Reagan uh, made use of quite a bit of the points that uh, Brother Ward deals with in that book, Unseen God, and so I commend that to you. Uh, he is the co-owner of DeWard Publishing, and he's been standing by uh, the DeWard table back there, and he'll answer any questions that you have about that. He preaches at the 58th Street uh, congregation in the Tampa area, and so we're pleased to sit at the feet of Brother Nathan Ward. I'm in Athens, Alabama on my 20th anniversary. I'm not sure if that uh, warrants kudos or Kevlar when I get home. <laughs> but uh, one way or the other, we're here. And uh, someone asked me what I'll do to make it up to her. And uh, the, the short answer is a couple weeks from now, I'll be going uh, with Bill Bynum to the Czech Republic to do some preaching. I'm taking her with me. So I'm, I'm taking her to Prague is what I'm doing um, on another preaching trip. So. Well, I, I will echo what so many of the other speakers have said and probably will continue to say, and that is that I cannot in this uh, short time frame cover everything that I put in the lecture manuscript. I'm going to hit most of the high points and work my way through it, but uh, we just can't get to everything there. And even the lecture manuscript itself can't talk about everything that there is to talk about. Uh, one of the things I like to do when I write this sort of thing is load you up with footnotes of multiple other resources. And uh, we are right now living in what I consider something of a golden age of apologetics. Um, there have probably been, since the 1980s or so, more apologetics books written in the last 40 years than maybe the entire human history before that. And I don't know if that's an exaggeration, and if it is, it's not much of one. Uh, what we used to cover, you know, in an apologetics textbook, 25 chapters or so on 25 different topics. Now there's that sort of thing, but also there's multiple books, entire books written to each of those chapter topics. Uh, it is just a wealth of information. There are multiple seminaries these days that have master's and doctorate degrees in apologetics, which is a really a brand new sort of, of thing that is out there. So there are resources all over the place. I included as many of them as I thought appropriate, probably more than were appropriate, in the footnotes. And I would uh, encourage you, I know a lot of people don't like to read footnotes, I understand, uh, but I would encourage you to take a look at those. If some of the points that I mention in passing you want to explore more, I try to give you information of where, uh, at least what I consider to be a good uh, place to be to look at those. My topic is, I believe that Jesus is the Savior of the world. And in the description I received, I understood that the, the, the real emphasis uh, in, in that title is the word the. Uh, that's not how they said it. Uh, that would sound weird, right? I want you to emphasize the word the. Uh, but think about it as I say it again. I believe that Jesus is the savior of the world, the one and only savior of the world. That's the point of this lecture, is that there is no other way to be saved except by Jesus. This is, of course, the Christian claim. The biblical claim as well is that Jesus is the Christ and he is the only way to God. 
And the skeptics don't really like that idea, and they'll uh, push back in a variety of different directions. Some people will say Jesus never said any such thing. That's an invention of later Christianity. The biblical record can't be trusted. The Gospels aren't reliable historical sources. Extremists will even say that Jesus never existed. I was listening to Dr. Payne last night, and one of the things that crossed my mind to say, if I was speaking on the topic of I believe that Jesus existed, is to say, hey, even Bart Ehrman, the ultra, ultra skeptic, says that denying the existence of Jesus is idiocy. I mean, when you got someone that extreme saying, yeah, it's obvious he existed, but some will even go that far in saying that, no, Jesus isn't the only savior, he never even existed. Or you can reflect on it not from that perspective, but from the perspective of the postmodern society that we live in now where it's really not an issue of what Jesus did or didn't say, or whether the Gospels can or cannot be trusted, or even whether Jesus did or did not exist. They simply don't care what Jesus said. In fact, many of them reject the very notion of objective truth, and certainly the notion of judgment at the end of time for how you lived your life. And those who do accept God and an afterlife will tell you that there are multiple different paths to get to heaven. And so these are the sorts of things that I want to try to cram into uh, 40, 38 minutes or so that I, I have uh, left now. I want to present for you the exclusive claims of Christianity, both the explicit claims, such as Jesus saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except by me, and the implicit claims as well. One thing I never really thought about quite in this way until I started working on this lecture is that the very deity of Jesus is an exclusive claim that he is the savior of the world. It's implicit rather than explicit, but it's there. You see, Jesus isn't the only way because he just so happens to know the path. Jesus is the only way to God because Jesus is God. And there is no one else who has ever lived who has been God. And so where else are you going to go to find the way to God except God? And so there are all sorts of ways of reflecting on this idea, and we can't uh, cover all of them, but we'll do what we can. And so I want to start with these exclusive claims of Christianity, both toward his deity, his character, his messiahship, and those very clear statements as well. I'll start with Paul. He was the earliest writer of Christianity. The earliest documents of the Bible that we have come from the pen of Paul. And in summary, I would say that Paul has a very, very high view of Jesus that understands him to be divine. There's a variety of ways we could reflect on that, but I want to point you toward two passages very quickly. We don't have the time to thoroughly uh, investigate them, but just to reflect on them. First of all is Colossians. In Colossians chapter 1 and then in Colossians chapter 2 as well. Colossians chapter 1 verses 15 through 20 is this hymn of praise to Christ. And in, among other things, in that hymn of praise to Christ, it identifies him as the image of God and the creator and sustainer of the world. So here is a very explicit, direct claim that Jesus is, in fact, deity, and with all the implications that that brings as well. In chapter 2 and verse 9, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily in Jesus. And again, a very clear claim that Jesus is God. The other passage is not as explicit, but I think it's maybe even more profound once you recognize what's going on, and that's in Philippians chapter 2. In this passage, we know very well, it's a passage that we read frequently before the Lord's Supper, perhaps, to reflect on Jesus uh, becoming a human and dying the death on the cross. But in addition to its emphasis that Jesus pre existed as deity, I would point you toward the end of this text that tells us something very important that's easy to miss if we don't recognize what's going on. And basically, the, the short version of this is Philippians 2, 5 through 11 tells us that Jesus bears the name of God. And the reason that we miss it is because it never uses the name of God. It says the stand-in for the name of God that all the Jews used in that day. And that comes a couple of phrases after what you would think would be the cue is. 
And so what the text says is, of course, he was given the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee would bow and every tongue would confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, what we're inclined to do, perhaps, is say he's given the name that is above every name, and that name is Jesus, because at the name of Jesus, that's what comes next. Well, as was said just this morning, the name Jesus is a very common name. It's the Greek version of the name Joshua uh, from the Old Testament. Very, very common name. There's nothing special about that name, and that's not the name that is given to him as his exaltation. That was the name that was given to him by Joseph and Mary when he was born at the angelic direction, but they're the ones who gave him that name. If you asked any Jew in the first century, particularly a highly educated one like the Apostle Paul, who was trained under Gamaliel, who was a rising star in Phariseeism, he probably was the next Gamaliel before he turned his back on it, as far as that goes. If you asked someone like Paul, what is the name that is above every name? They'd have all said the exact same thing. It's the name of God. There's no other name that compares to the name of God. It is his name, and he jealously guards it, and he won't share it with anyone, Isaiah tells us. In fact, there's a passage in Isaiah that says, Every knee will bow before Yahweh, the name of God. But of course, we know that the Jews of the first century didn't say the name of God. They substituted another word for it. And the word that they substituted was the word Lord. So when you take the, the background of the name above every name being the name of God, and the name above every name, the name of God, being Lord, and how they talked about it, come back to the fact that he is going to be given the name that is above every name, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. I think the point of Philippians chapter 2 that is being made there is that Jesus is Yahweh. And there are some 30 plus Yahweh passages from the Old Testament that are applied to Jesus in the New Testament. Jesus is God. And if you reflect on other things that Paul says in his teaching, again, it's implicit, but it's very clear that Jesus is the only Savior. The wicked sinfulness universality of it in Romans chapter 1 through 3 has to be solved somehow, right? How is that sinfulness, that universal sinfulness of humankind solved in Romans? The sacrifice of Christ satisfies God's justice. We are dead in our sins in Ephesians chapter 2 verses 1 through 10. We are slated for condemnation at the judgment seat of God there. How do we solve that problem? Well, Paul tells us there that we are made alive in Christ. Obedience to the gospel in 2 Thessalonians 1 prevents uh, us from receiving eternal destruction. And it's the gospel of Jesus there in that text. So Paul's very clear in his writings that Jesus is the Savior of the world. So also are the apostles in what they say. You think of the apostle John in his gospel that begins with this prologue that indicates that Jesus is deity in nature who is both the creation of the Father and the revelation of the Father. He is the one that makes God clear to us, John says. And you see the confessions of some of the early followers of Jesus in the, in the beginning of the Gospel of John as well. Andrew, who says that he's the Messiah. Nathaniel, who says that he's the Son of God. Thomas, who wraps up the Gospel by saying of him, my Lord and my God. Or you follow the apostles in the book of Acts. And how do they present the Gospel? How do they present the way that people can be saved in the book of Acts? Well, consistently, it is in the context of the resurrection and the exaltation of Jesus. The gospel of salvation is the resurrection of Jesus, is, is where it is found. Now, obviously, there's a whole lot more of that that needs to be unpacked, but that's the fundamental message that gets preached over and over and over again in Acts. There's not a sermon in Acts, I don't think, that fails to mention the resurrection of Jesus. How do you want to be saved? You focus on Jesus. Of course, Peter says it very clearly in Acts chapter 4, there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. One of my favorite places to 
reflect on a human perspective about Jesus is in his mother. Mary kind of falls to the background through the Gospels, rightfully so. It's not a story about her. When she does appear, Jesus seems to really put distance between them as much as anything. But through all of the ministry and the trial and the death of Jesus, she doesn't say much of anything. Here's a woman who knows beyond all doubt the true origin of Jesus. Of all the people who've ever lived, everyone except Mary had faith in the origin of Jesus, the divine origin of Jesus. Mary knew. There are a host of mothers that have lived through the centuries who would have lied to spare Jesus. Can you imagine what it would be like to stand there and watch your son be beaten and crucified? The fact that she stands in silence while her son is tried and convicted and executed, that silence speaks volumes about what she knew concerning her son. Either she was convinced of his identity, or as Homer Haley said in his book on John, she takes her place among the arch criminals of history, confederate to a conspiracy of hypocrisy, deceit, blasphemy, imposture, and fanaticism. What she doesn't say says a whole lot when you stop and and the claims of Jesus himself are just as remarkable. I'm going to go through a list here very quickly. And I've drawn heavily on that book I just mentioned by Brother Haley uh, about John. And you can see the full citations of the verses I'm going to quickly allude to here in the manuscript. If you look at his book, he fleshes all of this out a whole lot more. But very quickly in the Gospel of John, you could reflect on Jesus' claims in a variety of ways. So, for example, in his relation to God, in the Gospel of John, Jesus claims to have come from God. He claims to have alone seen God. He claims to know God in a unique way. He claims to reveal God, to be equal to God, and to do the works of God. Jesus says at various places in the Gospel of John that to see him is to see God. To hear him is to hear God. To believe him is to believe God. And to reject him is to reject God. Is there any confusion about what Jesus is saying in all of this? It's pretty clear, isn't it? Jesus is equating himself with God. Regarding the Messianic hope, Jesus confesses himself to the Samaritan woman first to be the Messiah. And he says it again in his trial that he is a king. He claims to be a prophet, which the Jews expected to be coming with the Messiah. He claimed himself to be the good shepherd, reflecting on the Old Testament prophecies of a shepherd king who was to come. Regarding human needs, he confesses himself to be the revelation of God to humanity. He confesses that he is the way to God. He claims to be the savior from sin. He says that he provides spiritual sustenance to humanity by being the bread of life, by being the water of life, by being the vine to which one must be connected to receive nourishment. He says that he is the way to conquer death. It's in this, this category and his claims regarding human needs that he says to his apostles, I am the way and the truth and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. He clearly believed that he was the savior of the world. One of the interesting things, if you read what skeptics have to say about Jesus as it relates to this, is that they'll say somewhere in some sort of way, Jesus never actually claimed to be God. Jesus never said, I am deity in the flesh, or some such thing along those lines. That position can only be held if you are either ignorant of everything that Jesus said, or you refuse to practice basic common sense about what Jesus said. The culmination of what Jesus says about himself and what others say about him is unambiguous. 
There's no doubt what Jesus is getting at here. It is, Jesus never utters the words, I am deity in the flesh, but everything that Jesus says together is basically, I am deity in the flesh. This is pretty obvious when you think about it. The message of the Gospels, the Epistles, and the book of Acts, and the book of Revelation, as far as that goes, is that Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is divine, and Jesus is the one and only way to God. Now, this puts us in a little bit of a spot, right? Because uh, when you have that kind of claim, well, it's either right or it's wrong. It's either true or it's false. There, there's no in-between about this, right? And this brings us to what is frequently called the C.S. Lewis trilemma, and he's not the first person to make this claim, but he probably does so more famously than anyone else. And so I'll give you a long quote here in just a second that you've probably heard before, but it, it's worth quoting every time you get a chance to. It's just one of those kinds of quotes. But you think about this. If Jesus is wrong, he is uh, he's either wrong intentionally or unintentionally, right? He either is wrong and he knows it, or he's wrong and he doesn't know it. If he's intentionally wrong, he's either a charlatan or a pathological liar. If he's unintentionally wrong, if he, if he thinks he's telling the truth, but he isn't, isn't, then, you know, he's mentally imbalanced with a very real Messiah complex when you stop and think about it. Um, so what do you do with this? Well, this is what Lewis says. He says, I'm trying here to prevent anyone from saying that really foolish thing that people often say about him. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who is merely a man and said the sorts of things that Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic, on the level with a man who says he's a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman, or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. And so this has rightly been called the Lord liar lunatic trilemma. Jesus must be one of these. And to the skeptics who want to throw legend in there these days, he was merely a legend. That just doesn't hold any water whatsoever. It's a whole different lecture, maybe a whole different series of lectures to really flesh out the reliability of the Gospels. And again, I've given you some things to look at there if you care to in the footnote. But um, the idea that Jesus never existed or the Gospels were legendary embellishments just doesn't stand at all. Jesus either is a liar, he is crazy, or what he says matters more than anything anyone else has ever said. And those are the only options that we have. And this doesn't sit well in our culture. Exclusivism doesn't really uh, fit in with postmodernism. And so I want to spend the remainder of our time talking about the culture that we live in and how that relates to this teaching that Jesus is the Savior of the world. There are two uh, perspectives that, that have grown out of postmodernism uh, that are important for us to reflect on as we consider this teaching of the Bible. The first is called relativism. Relativism holds that there is no such thing as objective truth. Uh, it, it's the rejection of absolute truth. Uh, it, it says, among other things, that multiple things can all be true at the same time, even things that are contradictory to one another can be true at the same time. So that's relativism. Pluralism is the religious or moral outgrowth of relativism. It takes that same idea and applies it to religions in particular. Basically, pluralism says that all diverse views about truth and morality should be considered equally valid. That no single view should be considered right for everyone, and no one standard of moral behavior should be considered universal. We must tolerate that great 20th, 21st century buzzword that we have, that has been hijacked. Um, we must tolerate all views equally. Let me just say one thing about tolerance here. 
Our culture believes that if you disagree with someone, you don't tolerate them. If you, if you disagree with someone, you hate them. That's what our culture preaches. Tolerance presupposes disagreement. If you don't disagree with someone, you can't tolerate them. You don't tolerate someone you agree with. You agree with someone you agree with. There must be disagreement in order for there to be tolerance. True tolerance isn't unanimity. True tolerance is loving people you disagree with. And that's what we must strive to do as Christians. Hold fast to the truth, but love those that we disagree with. And treat them kindly, regardless of what they do to us. Well, what do we do with this, uh, setting that aside, what do we do with this pluralism and relativism? Well, one of the interesting things about this is, is how rapidly this has become a major issue in preaching about Jesus. I mean, postmodernism rose up in the middle of the 20th century is when it really started to get traction. Uh, it really became an issue in the 80s and 90s. You can find just scads of books written uh, in that time period about postmodernism, and that kind of itself tells you that's when it's taking off, is this is when all the religious writers are starting to address it. In The Reason for God, Tim Keller's uh, apologetics book, he says that in his three-decade ministry as a Presbyterian pastor in New York City, this issue is the thing that he hears the most frequently when he tries to preach about Jesus. Now, my point isn't Presbyterianism or not, obviously, but here's a man who's trying to preach Jesus in the biggest city in America, and he says what he hears is an objection more than anything else is the difficulty of there being just one true faith. And with that, the supposed arrogance of believing that you're right, that others are wrong, and that it's awful to try to convince someone of that, that you're right and they're wrong. And this is not limited to postmodern secularists. In Christendom at large, there was a survey that was done recently, uh, and it shows just how pervasive postmodern thought is. And this is Christendom at large in the broadest sense of that word. Um, Anyone who would consider themselves to be a Christian could have been part of this survey. So uh, understand that that's the basis of this. But in that survey, 60% of people who identified themselves as born-again Christians, 60% of born-again Christians from the ages 18 through 39 agreed, agreed with the statement that Buddha, Muhammad, and Jesus are all valid paths to God. 60%. I would hope that the numbers among our 18 to 39 year olds aren't that high. But I'll tell you, my experience over the last decade or so as an FC professor includes having to argue positions that people my age and older just take for granted. Postmodernism is making inroads. Young people, including our young people, are being influenced by this thinking, and we need to know how to refute it. So what do we do with postmodernism? Let me suggest a few things here in the time that we have left. One thing that is important to reflect on is the nature of truth. Truth excludes its opposite. This is the law of non-contradiction that goes back, you know, millennia. Two things, two contradictory things cannot both be true at the same time and in the same sense. And it's obvious, right? This was universally recognized for thousands of years. And it's still obvious in normal life. It's obvious in the hard sciences. It's obvious in mathematics. I mean, it's either Tuesday or it's not Tuesday. You either had breakfast this morning or you didn't have breakfast this morning. Either the lightning won the Stanley Cup or they didn't. Two plus two is four. 2 plus 2 is not 5, 2 plus 2 is not 17, 2 plus 2 is not giraffe. You can't make it whatever you want to make it. And we understand how that works where it's measurable. Everywhere that truth is measurable, truth is objective. And it cannot be argued any other way. It's a crazy thing that relativism only starts to pop up in the abstract rather than the concrete. It's just religion where suddenly truth is wishy-washy, right? It's just philosophy and morality 
where suddenly truth has changed one way or the other. Well, let me suggest to you that the nature of truth does not change because the nature of the subject has changed. Truth is truth, and truth does not change. And if at every point where truth can be measured, it's objective, then doesn't it follow that the nature of truth remains that even when it can't be measured? Truth excludes its opposite. That's what truth is. And that means that even if you can't measure it like a math problem, if Jesus is the Savior of the world, then no one else is. If Jesus is the way to God, then no one else is. If he is the only name that you can call on to find salvation, then no other name can be called on. That's the nature of truth. And as you reflect further on relativism, it fails in so many ways. I mean, you just think about it, it clearly can't be lived out as a way of life. You can't make up your own truth and expect to live by it. I mean, again, people want to do that in abstract ways, but it's abundantly obvious that you can't do it in a real way. You decide you want to fly? Your truth can be that gravity doesn't apply to you today. <laughs> you know what's going to happen? Gravity's going to say, sorry, buddy. There's a reason why no one tries to do that with gravity. The person who's perfectly happy lying to you and would claim moral relativism as a reason for lying to you suddenly gets upset when you lie to them. Funny how that works, isn't it? It's a great story I came across in an apologetics book about a professor who had a relativist student, just ardent relativist student. My truth is my truth, and my truth can change from day to day, and all of that sort of thing. And when she turned in her final exam, he didn't even look at it, he just put a zero on the paper and turned it, returned it back to her. And uh, she came storming to his office, <laughs> suddenly an ardent believer in objectivity. Her answers were right, and he said, sorry, my truth is that only answers in purple ink are correct. And wouldn't you know it, <laughs> there's reality all of a sudden, isn't there? Relativism can't be lived out. The other thing that's really interesting about relativism is that it commits all of the sins that it tries to avoid. Everything that it accuses other people of doing, it does the exact same thing. So consider some of these sorts of tenets of relativism. Some relativists will say all religions are basically the same and specific doctrines are insignificant. That's what a pluralist would say. All religions are basically the same and specific doctrines are insignificant. Focus on that last part. Specific doctrines are insignificant. You know what that, that sentence sounds like to me? It sounds like a very significant specific doctrine is what it sounds like to me. The relativist or the pluralist will say that each religion only sees part of the truth and none can see the whole truth. Sounds like a pretty wholesome truth statement there, doesn't it? That they're trying to make there. It's, it's held up to be true, wholly true of all religions. They'll say it's arrogant to claim a kind of knowledge that is superior to others, which is a claim to a kind of knowledge that is superior to others, isn't it? It's arrogant to insist that one's religion is correct and try to convert other people to it. It's amazing how many books are written trying to convert people to relativism. In fact, that statement kind of does that, isn't it? It's an insistence on a correct belief with the intent of changing the viewer or the view of the hearer to the same belief, to convert them. Exclusive claims to superior knowledge of spirituality cannot be true. Exclusive claims to a superior knowledge of spirituality can't be true. You know what, that sounds suspiciously like an exclusive claim to a superior knowledge of spirituality, doesn't it? One of my favorite things that you hear from relativists is that um, what you're doing when you claim to know the truth is an ethnocentric imposition. You are forcing your view on other people. It's an ethnocentric imposition. 
You know who believes in postmodern relativism? Uh, 21st century Western countries. And you know what they're doing when they try to convert everyone else to relativism? Ethnocentrically imposing their view is what they're doing. Again, they're doing the exact same thing. There's no such thing as objective truth. Except perhaps that statement, I suppose. Truth about reality is not knowable. Except that, I suppose. We should doubt everything. Except that, I suppose. Opposite positions can both be true. No, they can't. See, that's the opposite position. They would deny it's true. So, what do you do with this? <laughs> well, what you do with it is you look at it and you shake your head and laugh, just like you're doing right now. Postmodern relativism is impossible to practically live out. Postmodern relativism fails at overcoming the very things it perceives to be failings in others. In other words, postmodern relativism is intellectually bankrupt. There is no reason whatsoever to ever listen to anything that comes from that perspective, except to understand how to refute it, to reflect on it, to see how shallow it is. And it comes from all these high-minded intellectuals. All these people who, you know, sit up in their ivory towers and don't ever try to apply any of this nonsense to real life. And they say it in such a way that sounds so impressive sometimes. Don't be fooled. It's intellectually bankrupt is what it is. And of course, we can't talk about this without talking about their favorite story. The favorite story of the pluralist and the relativist is the blind men and the elephant. You know that one, right? The blind men and the elephant. And they'll use it for different purposes. The pluralist will say this is how we know that multiple religions can all be correct. The relativist sometimes will go so far as to use this to say there's no such thing as objective truth. The way the story goes is like this. There are four or five, or it depends on how the story is being told at any given time, four blind men are trying to describe what an elephant is like. One of them has a hold of its trunk and says the elephant is a lot like a hose. And one of them has a hold of its leg and says the elephant's a lot like a tree. And one is on its side and says the elephant's a lot like a wall. And the last one has its tail and says the elephant is a lot like a rope. And you see, says the postmodernist, they're all right. They all are correctly describing the elephant. And this is what we are like, in fact. Blind people groping after God, and we each have a small corner, and we each see him from our own unique perspective, and this is why we can all be right at the same time, even if it appears as if we are not, in fact, all right. Well, let me tell you several problems with this story. First, I suppose I should say it's a, a, it's a great story for talking about why blindly looking at something can lead you to different perspectives. It's a great story for saying why only seeing a piece of the information can lead to different uh, views on that thing, but it does not hold up under the weight that they want to put on the back of this story. First of all, remember one of the great objections of postmodernism is the evil of arrogance. Just how awful it is to believe that your view is right and to try to, to, try to convince other people to follow your view. What this story does in its effort to make everyone right is to say that all religious adherents are somehow wrong and the only person who can see anything is the postmodern storyteller. He's the only one that knows it's an elephant. This story, when applied the way that it is applied, is the most arrogant story that could possibly be told. You're all blind and I know the truth. That truth, ironically, of course, is that there's no truth. This story, in seeking to disprove that there's only one right view, is claiming to have the one right view. Secondly, I'd point out that they are not, in fact, right. Every one of them is wrong. 
They don't say the elephant's trunk is like a hose. They don't say the elephant's leg is like a tree. They don't say the elephant's side is like a wall. They say the elephant is like a hose. The elephant is like a tree and so forth. Have you ever seen an elephant and thought, hmm, you know, I can't tell. Is that a tree? I'm not sure. Maybe it's an elephant. Maybe it's an elm. Can't tell. Which is it? Well, anyone who's seen an elephant knows that it is not, in fact, like any of these things that they say that it is like. Yes, in some small way, there is a small resemblance. But an elephant's leg won't ever confuse you for a tree either. They're not right. They're wrong. And so this story, in, in its effort to prove that they're all right, does so with four propositions that are, in fact, all wrong. A bigger problem for this story than any of that, though, is that it presumes objective reality as a given in order to disprove objective reality. Stop and think about this for a second. Why does this story work as a story? Aside from the fact that it doesn't. Why does it work as a story? Well, it works because of the objective reality of what an elephant's leg is like, the objective reality of what a tree trunk is like, and the fact that you can objectively compare them to each other and they are objectively similar to each other. At every point in the story, it requires objectivity. What if the story said... One blind man had the elephant's tail and says, the elephant's a lot like a bookcase. And one had the elephant's side and said, the elephant's a lot like an electric eel. And one had the elephant's trunk and said, the, uh, the elephant's a lot like a Buick. Is anyone going to buy anything the story's selling at that point? Of course not. At each point in the story, it requires objectivity to prove subjectivity. Postmodernism is intellectually bankrupt. The biggest problem with the story is that it presumes that we're blind. It ignores the possibility that God has in fact revealed himself. And of course the biblical claim and the Christian doctrine is that God has done just that. And that he has done so in the person of Jesus of Nazareth. And if that is the case, then there is a way to see God. And the way to see God isn't by blindly groping after him and hoping you can catch a corner and maybe in some small way describe something of kind of how it's like something else. The way to see God, the only way to be blind people groping after God, is to look at Jesus. Because Jesus is the only way to God. Jesus is the Savior of the world. Thank you so much for your kind attention.